Hello, welcome to uh, episode 19 of The Board. Today we are going to be talking all about risk and agile, how people perceive agile to be risky and how we mitigate risk. Uh, I'm Gavin Cochran, agile coach at Boost. I'm joined by Kristen Donaldson and Paul Fuello. <laughs> um, Thanks for that. Thanks. Uh, do you guys want to introduce yourselves? No, no, that's okay. I think that was a fantastic introduction. Yeah. Okay. S- sorry, guys, we're, we had a few technical issues, but we're uh, on air now. Yep. So please feel free to ask us questions as we're going. Um, so, yeah, as Gavin was saying, we're going to be talking about risk and agile at the moment. Um, I wanted to start with um, the reasons why people think that um, agile is more risky than more traditional project mm-hmm. management methods such as waterfall. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of, one of the major ones is that there's a perceived <coughs> lack of documentation yep. in Agile. And we've, we've devoted, I think, a whole show to this before, talking yep. about the types of documentation you see in Agile. It's, it's a question we get an awful lot from people, you know, it doesn't mean that there's no documentation in Agile. No, I think the concern comes from people who use like a gated process. Mm. They expect to see a whole bunch of requirements up front before yep. they go into the design phase. Mm. and uh, um, I think that's where part of this concern comes from, is that we don't have that huge set of requirements. In fact, we, we, we you know, we create a fairly small set of requirements. And then lean, I think you'd call lean. it. So yeah. do you think that people find that, say for example, um, a really long functional specification, they find that reassuring in some manner? Yeah. And uh, uh, we were talking to somebody about this yesterday and they, they used a sentence which I quite like, which is rather than documenting what you th- how you think something's going to work, you know, document how it actually does work. That's right. Which uh, I think is uh, quite so an important th- thing to know. That's much more of the agile approach. So we have like user stories, which are our upfront requirement specification, mm-hmm. but we do them just in time. Um, or, you know, like a lean approach, mm. and then we have uh, that kind of a- as we're completing our user stories, we're updating the relevant bits of our documentation mm-hmm. th- um, as part of our definition of done. Usually, yeah. you know, making making sure that. Um, the, the system's well documented, making sure that the code's well documented, but also updating user mm-hmm. documentation, maybe, or system specs, or what, what you know, yeah. readme files, that kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, we've talked about this before. I think the problem is um, the perception around documentation in Agile. I think once you talk to people about what constitutes documentation, mm-hmm. because it looks different from yeah. the documentation on a, on a waterfall project, um, it just needs to be made clear to people that there is some, it just looks different. And uh, I think the uh, another thing that worries people sometimes is the um, another one of the agile principles, which is responding to change over following a plan. People think, oh, you guys don't, don't plan anything yeah, yeah. in the world of agile, yeah. um, which again is a misconception. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I suppose mm-hmm. the difference is that we don't spend uh, a vast amount of time up front planning every little thing, uh, including stuff that mightn't get built or stuff that mightn't be important. Mm-hmm. So we're doing, would you call it just in time planning or? Yeah, well, yeah, no, but I, th- I think we, because we definitely have a plan, but you yeah. know, we, we, aff- it, we accept the fact that the plan's going to change. Mm. Yeah, I and, think that's and, it. and that's the key thing is we don't spend, like you say, um, there's an arc and <laughs> it gets to the point when you hit the sweet spot, you've got just enough information on your plan mm-hmm. and, mm. and any more effort that you put in is just wasted time. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, so just, mm. gut, you know, once you hit that sweet spot, I think it's a gut feeling. Yes. Yeah, we've got enough to go with. Mm. But, you know, I, I think, um, I know it's a bad analogy, um, but um, I, I know there's quite a few um, quotes from generals, you know, from the Second World War, for example, like, um, or, or, or there's a famous one, which is no plan survives contact with the enemy, mm. or no plan survives beyond the first bullet being fired, or whatever the quote is, but yeah. it's mm. the point being both that good. things always change. Things change, mm. and they, they often change yeah. in unknown ways, yep. and so responding to that change is the best thing that you can do, and, and mm. I, I've, I did work I worked with some really good project managers who were r- really c- adaptable in terms of their plans, mm-hmm. and they were very good at communicating those changes back to the um, people above, the client, whoever it was. And then I've worked with some that have kind of tried to force the team to stick to their plan, you know, and stick to that Gantt chart, mm. Mm. and and work weekends and work till four o'clock in the morning and all that kind of stuff. And so you know, <coughs> we don't do that in in uh, in a sustainable. Yeah. working environment. So. That's right. and, yeah. and another one that people worry about is um, you know, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Mm-hmm. And they think, well, there's, you know, 
it's very risky if we don't get everything hashed out and um, in a long contract beforehand. Um, things are very risky, but for me, the very fact that it's customer collaboration all the way through mm. um, makes sure that that risk is actually far, far less. And Does it becomes clear actually talking about all these um, agile principles. It's all about perception and how you read these mm. principles. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and, and the fact that you cooperate <coughs> with yeah. and collaborate and not. Because look, look at look at the national health system, um, that health system they've been building in the UK, mm. and that contract was um, mm. that you know the government are saying the UK government are saying that again just demonstrates that the UK government is incapable of managing contracts, and it, is, it, is it really that they can't manage contracts? Is it the way they're trying to manage the contract? Yeah, and is it the approach that's flawed? Because you know that that system grew, they they discovered new things. Mm -hmm. If you want innovation with new technologies and so on, then you're going to have to accept there's some unknowns in your you can't well, you, you have to have flexibility to have innovation. That's mm -hmm. right. Otherwise, it's like the death of innovation, isn't it? So oh, yeah. being inflexible. Inno innovation creates um, variability, mm. and mm -hmm. you have to be able to manage that in your yeah. plan. But I think going back slightly, when you're talking about the perception um, of, of these things in Agile, um, there is work to be done at the start of the project with people who are not familiar with Agile mm. to help them understand. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and it can yeah. be tempting sometimes because we are all about getting things done and avoiding delays to just start moving forward immediately. Yeah. But I think you really need to be careful about making sure all of those perceptions are um, clear. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I think we've noticed that a couple of projects mm -hmm. we've started recently. Yeah. With, I don't, w w w you know, we did, we need to do more work keeping uh, putting the people at ease because mm. it is a new process for people. Yeah, and, and building yeah. trust at, at from the beginning. And, and we do work very fast. It mm. does, you know, and that speed does scare them when they, you know, yeah. they're not they don't feel like they're in control. So. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Um, <coughs> one thing that we're going to be talking about today is this white paper. Uh, which is written by Nathan here at Boost, and it's about um, managing risk with Agile. Um, hmm. It's a good white paper, just, uh, I think it was just finished yesterday. Or yeah, it's, it? it's been released, and we'll put the URL up for um, people to access that after the show. Yeah, so we're going to be talking a little bit about the contents of um, this, basically. Mm -hmm. So, might as well start. Um, first of all, it goes through some of the actual risks that you uh, do you find in software projects? Well, the four main risks, I suppose, mm -hmm. that you find in software projects. First one um, being, um, let's see, I think it's uh, quality, poor quality in software projects. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I mean, that's something that we see time and time again in, in large projects. And, you know, NovaPay is probably a great example of that as well. So this, this goes back to the iron triangle, as it's known, mm. and the fact that people try and fix all yeah. three elements, they try to fix the scope the budget and the schedule mm. yeah. for their projects. They want a fixed price, fixed schedule. Fixed yeah. And it's that yeah. schedule that quite often forces people to, to sort of stumble onto this um, absolute deadline and, and the quality drops. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, so, and so what we know for, for sure is that people, in terms of their requirements, they, that so part of the danger of doing a lot of upfront work, up work on your requirements is that they kind of stick rigidly to those requirements mm. when they they don't, they don't seem to realise that they won't need a lot of the stuff in that requirement list. Mm, and mm. so even with agile projects where they do a lot of work front work on, they write a lot of user stories up front. They they f they, they can't because those user stories are still there on the backlog. There's a perception that they can actually be worked on, and the value of mm. them isn't truly understood. And so and the same you know it's this case of you aren't going to need it kind of you know mm. approach. And we need to be quite clear. Uh, you know that we need to sort of. Um, wheedle out those kind of those yeah I think I think you're right it needs to be clear from the start that actually the stuff at the backlog may not be important and it might not get built yeah. so th I mean that, that's one thing that's one way that you can instead of fixing your own triangle you can say well scope is flexible because yep. we accept that we're going to discover new things about our, yeah. our product yeah. as we're building it and yeah. other things might become more important and absolutely and I mean, because more and more budgets are absolutely fixed at the moment yeah and yeah. finding so yeah. um, you know that's what I've been talking about is let's be flexible with our scope so that we can meet <coughs> your absolute budget that's and, right. and give you what you need and often you discover like you do discover the value of, of as you're going along you realize oh yeah um, this feature is really important but mm. this feature I just don't need that I can't see a use for that you know mm. it's it was a buzzword I thought I thought yeah. we should do social media blah 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 but yeah, I'm not and, it, and there's plenty of ways of um, validating those yeah. thoughts as well through user testing like that in exactly. person or online yeah. you know it's not just sort of um, decisions being made by people who are, who are not going to use the product yeah 
And um, poor quality is also obviously going to have a big effect on you know the time that something takes and the money that you're mm. spending on a project oh. as well. It's a, it's one of those yeah it's unfortunately one of those things before people think oh because um, w- once the um, you know with everything fixed and your and quality begins to slip. Um, or, you know, because when people are under under time pressure, when a development team's under time pressure, they stop writing tests, they stop reviewing each other's code. Mm. They s- you know, the software is, is badly tested. Once that starts to happen, once qu- once quality slips on the software, for a developer it becomes it's it's, it's called technical debt. Yes. Yeah. Eventually, it will ca- will become technical debt, mm. and f- you know, it's just poor quality to start with. And as soon as it becomes technical debt, you, you it's like moving through treacle. Yeah, it all comes back yeah. round, doesn't it? Everything you do this takes so much longer mm. than it would have done as if, if you did kept, right. your, if you kept mm. your quality mm. higher and so um you know letting quality slip is a, a big mistake mm-hmm. i think projects should focus on quality and mm-hmm. the output should be quality you know one of the one of the key outputs should yeah be i mean you, you want the product to, to be usable at the end of the day that's right um, as opposed to having something that's chock full of features that are not actually very usable yeah and um, the second main risk that the uh, the paper talks about is projects being too expensive, and you know having all your resources swallowed up before everything's actually finished. And it goes, it actually mentions, uh, gives an example in the paper, which is the Queensland he- Health uh, Payroll System. Mm-hmm. Um, it was uh, had an expected cost of six point nineteen million dollars, and uh, ran over slightly. And uh, ended up costing about one point two billion dollars. I still can't believe those figures. Yeah, it's how, how can you go from six point one nine million to one point two billion? billion? Doesn't even make any sense. It's, a, it's, it's, it's co- coasting along. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I think everybody must must just pretend that it's not getting drastically out of hand yeah. and <laughs> put their head in the sand or something. How does that happen? I mean, what percentage of the budget is that? Is that that's well, that's I double basically. Um, oh no, it's not, not, not it's, double, sorry. It's, it's much more than double, isn't it? Yeah, it's, that's, that's uh, I'm not very good at maths, but I know that I've never gone it's a hell of an over overrun, a budget on a project, it's you know? A, exactly, a hell of a um, I mean, you know, when you're working in Agile, you're, you're always looking, at, you know where your money's being spent because of that constant cycle of delivery. Yeah. I, I can see that on a project like this, that there's no way they can have been using Agile because someone would have noticed, you know, mm. we've spent this much, but we've only got... Yeah. this much stuff as a, no. an IBM have been banned from Queensland contracts because of that, that whole situation so yeah, yeah. Um, so the third one um, that's mentioned in this particular paper and there's a lot more you know risks but this is just the four main ones that we talked about here uh, delayed delivery of a project yeah mm. I um, mean and Nova pays the classic one there on um, delayed delivery yeah yeah well it's a, a classic on a number of all yeah, of them, well, all yeah. of them yeah. actually yeah, but, um, yeah. The, the, the thing with the delay delivery, I think, um, I'm trying to remember what Mary Poppendeck's <coughs> quote was, um, but we need to work out ways of getting um, software to people faster so they yeah. don't have time to change their mind. Yes, and, and that was it, yeah. That basically, I paraphrase Mary there, but it's yeah. um, basically saying, it's nothing, you know, people, n- their current business needs aren't going to be the same business needs that they've in 12 yeah. months' time, you know. Yeah. So if you're trying to, if you're trying to write software that f- fixes a business need for them, then you need to make it current. It needs to be, mm. you know, 12 months time, things have changed. It's that cost of delay, isn't it? You yeah, know, delaying c- getting it to totally. them um, diminishes the value of the, what you're delivering. Yeah. 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 And uh, that brings us nicely to the last risk of us. Is it delayed? It's, it's a no value delivery. Oh, no value delivered. No value delivered. Yeah. Yeah. So what? it's, yeah. you know, basically you get your project out there. It might be in time, might be in um, scope even, it might be in budget, but um, you realize that you're releasing something out to the market that nobody actually really wants. Mm. And, uh, there's a quote in the white paper from Eric Reese, which is, uh, and that's achieving failure with your with your project. Mm. And, and basically, why I stopped working on government projects because I worked, my the last project I worked on <coughs> was um, we 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 um, spent nine months building a piece of software. We the requirements were fully met. It mm. was fully tested, acceptance tested, and so on. And we delivered it to the customer, and they said, "This isn't what we wanted." Yeah. Mm. And, and we spent another six months fixing. Mm. Um, and, and trying to right mangle into, into and, and something they yeah. wanted, given what they wanted, but we delivered no value to them. So imagine how amazing that would have been if you'd been able to talk to them exactly. throughout the project yeah. and confirm: is this what you want? Is this what you want? We had proxy business people on the project. Unfortunately, they weren't. You know, they weren't the real the right people. The right people. They weren't the actual people who were going to be using. Them. Yeah, they were s- making a lot of assumptions. Yeah. Do, do we have a question there? Yeah, we do. So from Gareth, what about project feasibility? How does Agile help with determining feasibility? 
Well, I suppose if you take the lean approach, I mean, that's I was thinking lean as well. It's about um, mm. valid, validating concepts. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so a lot of something that we do here at Boost a lot is <coughs> try and get the product down to the minimum viable <coughs> re- release, really. Mm. Mm. And when we say minimum viable, we don't mean just you know necessarily some you know a tiny segment of it, but really the the least viable thing that you can put out there and people will still use. And um, that's what we try to do to test the feasibility of a project and yeah. see, see how people are using it. See if and then using actually it. take it to end users. You know, do you find this useful? What kind of features would you like to see in this product yeah. in the future? Yeah. So ask them what they want. Don't you know build on assumptions. Yeah. Th- yeah. There is another aspect to what Gareth's asking, I think, as well, which okay. is the technology feasibility of it. Oh. Yeah. So you're you're doing some exploration because you're innovating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you don't know whether the technology is going to work, for example. Mm. Um, and so there is a there is a. Ma- uh, a a quadrant, uh, four, four quadrants, and it talks about um, high risk and high value stories, <coughs> and low risk and low value stories, mm-hmm. and the other quadrants are a mix of the two. Mm-hmm. And um, lean principles uh, um, suggest that you tackle the high risk, high value stories first. And so, high mm. risk being technology could be an issue, yeah. feasibility, you know, technology feasibility, or mm-hmm. it could be just user feasibility, but, um, mm. you know, it, is this idea going to fly? Yeah. But yeah. That, you know, high risk, high value stories get tackled first, yeah. mm. and you reduce your risk on those as quickly as possible. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so your so risk you is um, decreasing through the project? That, that's right, but the high value, high risk stories, you know, you're going to get, you know, you're not waiting to the end to work out whether the key mm. piece of technology that you wanted to use yeah. is going to work or not. You're, you're, yeah. you're, so you're, you're spent two hundred thousand yeah. dollars instead of two million dollars yeah, to get yeah. to the point that you realise the project wasn't feasible. Much better. Yeah. It's it's really important, I think. Yeah. That approach, you know, rather than going for the easy, quick wins, which actually aren't That's that right. useful. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You yeah. Know, in terms of value. <coughs> yeah. So. Okay, and in the white paper we have a um, beautiful pastel coloured agile risk management model. Which we... Hmm? It's not quite pastel. Is it not pastel? I would call that. I'm a guy. I don't know what's pastel. No, you what's don't. That. Um, and Joe, I believe we have a version of this to, uh, to put up on the screen. So these are some of the, r- the risks that we've talked about. And we're going to talk a little bit ab- uh, about four ways that you can actually manage um, risk. And you can see them up there. They are transparency, limiting your work in progress, uh, limit the batch size that you're working on and prioritization. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, let, let's go through those. Should we start with transparency? Yeah, mm-hmm. let's, let's um, I, I think when we were talking earlier about um, working in iterations and being able to see exactly where your budget's being spent and what features you're getting for the budget, mm-hmm. that's a major component of the transparency um, around agile projects that people are very interested in, you know, yeah, yeah. budget against features delivered. But there is also that um, collaboration aspect with the customer, you know, verifying, is this what you need? Is this what yeah, you want? Yeah, yeah. Is this the way you want it? Um, and that transparency rather than disappearing for weeks or months. Well, that, that's right, you know, and uh, we have our stand-ups and we have our retrospectives and we have, uh, have our reviews and it's something that everybody's always a part of and mm-hmm. always seeing it. So there, there's no um, brushing anything under the carpet. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's kind of, t- in the stand-up, for example, um, someone, that, that, you know, the store has been sized at a certain size, they say or a two or a three, mm. and then the developer discovers, or one of the develop, you know, the development team discover that the, it, a certain aspect of that functionality is going to take much longer to develop, or there's too much, there's a, you mm. know, and so th- 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 it's, it's really transparent for the product owner at that point, they can make a decision, do, mm. we, do they want to continue mm. pursuing that mm-hmm. path, or do they want to, yeah. is, it, is it worth spending that money? So that rather than us making assumptions about how they want to spend their budget, yeah. which quite often happens in waterfall projects, That's you know, right. you, you mm. make decisions on behalf of the client all the time, yeah. uh, which is where we quite often run into trouble in waterfall projects. Yeah. And I suppose that sort of transparency not only helps with the, you know, the expense and everybody's seeing where everything's been spent, but also, I mean, the quality is going to be maintained because mm-hmm. everybody's always inspecting that mm-hmm. and uh, ha- having yeah. a look at that. And yes, it's just never hidden from view. Yeah. Mm. And then the other form of transparency, of course, is the scrum board or the, yeah. or mm. the visible yeah. workspace itself, yeah. which is really obvious to when we worked at um, IR, for example, the, the other teams would walk past, mm. and, and they, they could see exactly what was going on, what exact, exact, when, what, ex- what that team was doing, mm. and you know they were. It really raises the profile of the project as well. And it, mm. and it, you know, there were managers walking past, and they mm. would, they would look at it, and then they'd go and talk to, to the product owner, mm-hmm. and yeah. say, oh, I didn't know you're doing this. I'm really yeah. interested in this. Um, mm. Even you know, like suggesting, 
the budget and other things might be made available if they were conti if they pursue this in a slightly different way, you know, mm. that kind of thing. Mm. It, was, it was really... It's a great way of communicating, um, you know, because quite often people get too busy or find it too hard to communicate to the wider business. I mean, yeah. and the visible workspace can do that job for you a lot of the time. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's key to keep that scrum board visible okay. and mm. and communicative, I think is the word. Is okay. it? And a communicative. <laughs> and okay, the next uh, the next way that you can manage risk, or the, the next way that Agile helps you manage risk, is uh, batch size and limiting the the, the batch reducing size. the batch reducing size, reducing the batch size yeah. that you're actually working on, and typically in waterfall projects, I suppose, and uh, other traditional uh, methods of project management. Um, you, you view a project as one massive whole that you have to you know get get to the end of. Whereas in Agile, you're breaking this down into smaller chunks and you're doing things in iterations and you're not really, it's not as daunting as working. In so what is the effect of reducing batch size? It reduces variability, increases, increases productivity. There we go. Yeah. So um, throughput's one of the key things that people miss with, with batch size, you know, making stores smaller mm. and, and so on is, uh, is, is worked um, wonders for one of the teams that I'm working mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. Their productivity, their throughput has increased considerably. Mm -hmm. yeah. The product owners are a, a standard by what's happening, and they've taken it back to their organisation, and their organisation is implementing smaller story sizes as well. Mm. Nice, um, nice. It's mm. had a profound effect on the way that team works. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Suddenly, their velocity has stabilised. There's no more variability between sprints. Um, you know, it's, it's and you're delivering finished features yeah. rather than those massive stories that you just don't get to finish. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. It's funny though, until you start doing it, until you start being quite tough on it, people people don't see it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, but I really need this massive story done. Um, but as soon as you start doing it, they can absolutely see the value of that. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a win-win situation because mm -hmm. the, there's no fuzzy requirements. Mm -hmm. They're pretty well defined usually yeah. on small stories. There's, um, the, the estimates are much more accurate because there's a smaller amount of yeah, work. It's easier. Yeah. Um, and that whole kind of cone of uncertainty, the closer you get to finishing something, the um, the more accurate your estimate, mm -hmm. that is that's in it's place. It's a shorter Yeah, because cycle. it's a smaller, um, a smaller chunk of work, mm. you're closer to finishing it, much more easy to mm. estimate. It's really good for morale as well, isn't it, it's on really Sprint, to, oh to yeah, keep yeah, closing yeah. stories, yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, rather yeah. than sort of slogging away. And yeah. so, sorry to interrupt, but I, I see we might have a couple more questions there. Oh, we do. There, so yeah, we'll sorry. Uh, too busy can, talking. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not unusual. So, <laughs> Petty, Petty Morgan, um, do you prefer to use burn down or burn up charts? That's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I've got a new uh, chart de jour at the moment. Have you got it with you? No, no I don't. Chart de jour. So chart de jour, we'll, yeah. We'll stick a Jacob up so for that. <laughs> what is it? Just before you start talking about that, I prefer burn ups to burn yeah. ups. But yeah, uh, I prefer burn ups as well. Um, They're really simple to understand yeah. at a glance. Yeah, yeah, um, they are. And they give you a really good idea of how things are going throughout mm. a sprint as opposed to throughout a whole project. I, I do like burn downs, but they're high maintenance. That's yeah, the problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's not, there it's are, true. there are, I mean, Rally, for example, it's one of its outputs is a burn down chart, yeah. right? and it's really good. But other other tools that we've got don't don't do it automatically, so it's mm. all about the Scrum Master going away and calculating. It doesn't or seem very agile spending make. a lot of time yeah. to create a graph. It yeah. doesn't. And then the, the team, and, you know, and the team didn't put much value in it, so yeah. I didn't. Oh, and that's the main point, that isn't it? It needs to be something that's useful for the team. That's right. Y um, so what's the chart you're using yeah, though? Yeah. Well, the, the chart I'm using at the moment is a is like a burn up chart. But it's um, it's called a cumulative flow diagram or a CFD, um, yeah. and it shows not just the burn up, um, but it also shows the work in progress. So it's got the work on one ba on one band. I I'll put a link up for this actually yeah, afterwards, yeah. Mm. Um, because there's a really good uh, Wiki <coughs> Commons diagram that demonstrates the benefits of cumulative flow diagrams. But basically, you're showing your work that's waiting, mm -hmm. um, you work the work that's in progress. The work that's completed but waiting to be accepted, mm -hmm. the work that's been accepted. Mm. And so you can see it's showing you all three, four queues, yeah. no, three, three queues of work. It shows you, so it's showing you your cycle time um, and so on. It's, it's, it's bottom. I think I've seen this, it looks like some coloured mountains. Yeah, it looks like some coloured <laughs> mountains. Yeah, it's, it's and, it, and it's mind blowing to start with because it's communicating so much information. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a really simple, like I say, Wiki Commons. Um, Diagram that someone put together, which shows exactly what, what the CFD is communicating, yeah. cool. and it, you soon get to see. Basically, you're looking at whether these bands are consistent, mm -hmm. because as soon as the bands become chunky or um, start, you know, exploding, there's, there's something there's going. A problem. There's something going wrong. Mm. Shrinking or exploding is a bad sign. Consistent mm. bands. So again, it's something you can tell at a glance. 
if it's working. The team know, can if, see. If the, teams, if the yeah. throughput is, is good. So it's all about analyzing cues mm. and it's lean principles again, mm. looking at cues and um, making sure that the cues are functioning. Tell me, did you notice some, I don't know if it's the same project, but did you notice a difference in this diagram when you started reducing the batch size, when you sort of started that push to reduce batch size? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Because so that really things, helped? Things don't, you, if, if you've got large stores, then in, you, you start to get this bulge in the, so you were seeing work, that. the work in progress um, queue mm. this starts to bulge out. Right. And then what happens when you've got, yeah, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes into play, but basically um, everyone's working on a story. They're, they're not acting as a team. They're mm. all, and they're trying to, because they've got large stories that they're getting bogged down in. So you get yeah. over utilization within the team. Their capacity is, you know, like 100% and um, you start to get this churn. Mm. And so, um, it's a really the diagram is really useful for that because as soon as you get a bulge, you know you're churning, yeah. and you need to focus more capacity on that bulge to get the to, mm. to smooth the uh, the queue or the um, the the, um, the queue. Sounds queue. good. Sorry, <laughs> just call uh, it the queue. And like Mike Paul said, we put a link a link up for that as well. Um, after so on the live stream page, we'll put up links to everything yeah. that we're talking about. There's a comment from uh, Petty as well saying it's international. Talk like a pirate day, so Arr. 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 I was yes. not aware of that, but I had wearing a striped skirt, obviously. <laughs> and, um, I'll, I'll have a few drinks later on, yeah. and then it'll come naturally. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And then um, Gareth Morgan, uh, we find cumulative flow hard to read as well. Arr. Arr. So um, <laughs> we'll, uh, I'll, I'll put that diagram up for you, Gareth. Hopefully, it'll help. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, cool. And um, and Patty says, nice, nice tips. Thanks. Nice. So what would be nice actually is if you had an example of, of when that bulge was there and yeah. then an example of the, the smoothed yeah. out diagram sure, sure. to show some contrast. We'll I've talk about that afterwards. The, I keep my CFDs. Perfect. So, so we'll, like, so we'll scan those in. Them. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I like where you usually take us through those CFDs. It's an exciting part of everybody's day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I like the love you are a genuine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 really. Yeah. Yeah. But let's, because uh, we're... Yeah, uh, really short in time. We're probably going to over go, go over our time a little bit. So you know, stick with us if you want to. It would be, I think, I'd say about. Well, you can watch it later at your leisure. Yeah. Yeah. So the next uh, way that we manage risk in agile is limiting the work in progress, and that's something that just makes a lot of sense to me. And there's different ways of of doing that. Uh, we all have our personal Kanban boards here, for example, is the way we do it on a person-to-person basis, mm -hmm. but. Um, I suppose limiting one's work in pro progress just make sure that that flow yeah, uh, right. can happen. So that's mm. looking. So when you do get bulges in your queue, i.e., you've got um, log jams. Mm. If you if you're overutilized, mm. if you you know if you if, if your team is at 100 percent capacity, there's no way that they can apply extra resource to clear that log jam. Mm -hmm. yep. So you just get that's when churn starts to happen. Yep. So yeah, work in progress keeps you know intentionally keeps your utilization lower. Than 100 percent, and wh I understand from like the stuff we've done with the scaled agile framework and so on. That's roughly um, so you've got time allocated to meetings through your sprint cycle. Mm. So 80 percent of your time is work, 20 percent of your time is meetings, and, things, and yeah. then they recommend 80 percent of 80 percent. So it's roughly 64 mm. percent utilization is ideal okay. for a scrum team. Yeah. 64 percent utilization is ideal for a scrum right. team. And I guess in Scrum, uh, part of the way that we limit the work in progress is through sprint planning, through and sprint planning, yeah. uh, you know everything's time boxed. So each sprint is obviously only you, mm. whether it's you know two weeks or four weeks, however long your sprint is, mm. and the team are only you know committing or I suppose forecasting to a amount of work that they can do in that time. Yeah. Hence, limiting their work in progress. Um, <coughs> so in it, I mean, the other way that teams often do this as well, they manage their, their if they're working on big stories, then mm. they will open less stories mm. at a time. If they're working on small yeah. stories then they'll probably open a lot of s smaller stories, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, just a, it's just a question, if they're, so if, they're, if, they're if they're big stories, the team will hopefully limit the number of stories that are in play so that they can work mm. on yeah. them together. Yeah, so and they'll come and clear those ones at the top and then move on, yeah, yeah. Right? work yeah. together. It's a real bad smell in a scrum mm. team if you've got a lot of open stories, yeah. and especially if yeah, there's more yeah. open stories than scrum team members, that's yes. a yeah. really bad smell. <laughs> well, uh, I remember like in a, in a company I used to work with before I came to New Zealand, it was a telecommunications company, and whenever the team was just working on projects and kind of organizing them, th th those projects themselves, mm -hmm. You know, there, there'd be a flow to it and projects mm. would get done in time. But mm. in that case, the web team was managed by the marketing team. Yeah. And so sometimes they just say, hey, we've made a decision. We've come up with an idea. We need it by the end of the week. It's a huge yeah. job. Everybody just yeah. work harder. 
Yeah, it's that wishful thinking, isn't it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. You no, know, we totally want this. So now we're going to do it. Yeah, you're at capacity now, but can you work hard? You're there, okay? Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and so there's all that context switching. There's all that kind of other stuff that when people are switching, there's like multiple tasks. You know, mm. you, you've got mm. so much. Um, it just drives productivity straight down. Oh, absolutely, and, and everybody would yeah. be hugely stressed staying late. It wouldn't get done by the end of the time. Marketing would be go mental, but it wouldn't be the team's fault. It would just be because they're working at yeah. capacity. Yeah. Somebody just throws in mm. a bunch of stuff and says it needs to be done in like you know three days time or whatever. Yeah. It's and just then you've left something else half finished, which is really yeah. bad for morale as well. Uh, well so yeah, the whole morale thing would be at the window. So of yeah. course we do. We, we manage that in Scrum by saying, well, this is the sprint backlog. Can you and we don't change it. We can't change it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and we're quite hard and fast about that rule. Mm. It seems a bit, a bit rigid, but it's there for good reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, it has happened, but it's sort of extreme circumstances, isn't it? It's a negotiation rather yeah. than you know someone coming and yeah. saying, can you do this for me? Yeah. Or exactly. Yeah. They, they know that they, have, they can't just do that with a Scrum yeah. team. Mm -hmm. They have to come and say, well, can I take this story out and put this yeah. story in? What yeah. do you guys think? Yeah. Like, mm. yeah. Okay, and um, let's go into the last um, thing that the white paper talks about in terms of managing risk. Is it prioritisation? It is prioritisation. <laughs> it's almost like you can read. I, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> and I was reading the post notes over there. See, pri prioritisation oh. and reprioritisation, that's the thing, isn't it? Because you're talking about, you know, your prioritising. It's true, it's a constant it's cycle, a constant isn't thing. it? It's a, you know, you, you're, you're looking at your value that's being delivered. You're seeing what the state of your product that is. You're prioritising, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, you're and adjusting prioritise. prioritise. priorities. It's also allowing the um, wider business to to bring different things in as well. I mean, they might come to review and think, actually, what we need now is this. So, so they're responding to lots of wider issues, um, you know, in the market as well, mm -hmm. and yeah. Um, yeah. being able to do that. Yeah, you know, not having this hard and fast list. But it's all about that value delivery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. And not, you know, and, and it got even the small. We were talking about it earlier when. You know, so a, developer, a member of the developer team says, this is really hard, we've got, um, you know, we're not going to get this um, done within the time we said we would, mm. then that's a prioritisation as well, you know, the, the product owner saying they've got a choice yeah. to make, should we continue yeah. throwing money or resource at this? Yeah, or it's, we, uh, it's the value that's going to be achieved high enough to justify this. That's right. And uh, it's, it's something I think that a product owner needs to be really, really aware of is the value of prioritisation. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, if they're new to Scrum or Agile projects and you ask them to prioritise them, they'll just say, yeah, that looks okay and leave mm. it, but you, you really need to think mm. about this and think about each story and think about um, why that's at the top of the list. I, or I think again though list. that's making it clear up front that some items may not get developed at the bottom of the backlog. When you make that clear, yeah. then prioritisation becomes more important. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a really good formula that I'm going to say to the people who are watching because we don't have much time. So there's some homework for you, go and look at um, weighted shortest job first. first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we put that link up before but we'll put it up again Yeah. Um, and it really does help. I mean not just, you know, um, and working on in software development, but every kind of um, managing workflow, I think yeah. it, it really helps. For me, doing things like writing proposals, um, yeah. I use that formula. Yeah, this is a nice uh, example here, actually, in the white paper about um, prioritization in a project that we actually worked on before, and it's for Real Choice, which is an app we did for NZ on screen, and you can watch their, their latest videos. Um, it's just an iOS app, and has uh, um, an example of our backlog here. Um, the first story was display one video full screen. The second was show multiple videos and let the user choose which to view. The third story was when the scre screen is in portrait view, show ad additional information about the video. And the fourth story was enable certain videos to be featured and display larger in the multiple video listing. So mm. each of those stories provides value to the user. The first story was display one video full screen. Already straight away, you've got some value to the And that was the, the minimum user. amount of value we could provide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then again, yeah. the second story, show multiple videos and let the user choose which to view. Again, just enhances that, that value. It, it, I mean, that we were really iterating. We were keeping these really small, as small as we could, and really iterating on that and just giving a little bit more value each time to yeah. the user, mm -hmm. you know, but still starting and finishing yeah. stories, yeah. you know. Um, so the last thing I'd like to, to cover from the, the white paper is um, the tyranny of wishful thinking, um, <laughs> the, the greatest risk of all. Yeah. Which dramatic. It is quite dramatic. I like it. Um, yeah. And... You know, that's this is a guy with wishful thinking. I, I'd say he probably knows what he's doing. He'll make it up that he's way up the rock. Risk, yeah, know. he has. Yeah. But um, basically, you have your scope and you have your you know uh, budget and you have your time frame mm. and you're basing all of this on your experience and wisdom. 
And if you have 20 years experience in, you know, in IT projects and stuff like Which that. Paul does. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's it's probably it's great wisdom. It's great experience. Yeah. If you, if it's a very well informed. That's right. And if you do exactly the same project over and over again, then you're guaranteed to do it the same as you did before. What? Yeah. I'm just saying that technology and innovation are really important parts of what we do. So mm -hmm. yeah. if you've got 20 years experience, yeah. it doesn't mean you, you know the technology that you're about to use on your next project. No. no. And so that's, the t that's one of the tyrannies of wishful thinking I think of, is people just don't understand the variability of new technologies that's right, that yeah. mm -hmm. um, bring to a, pr uh, a project. And so all of this kind of experience and rule of thumb and like, you know, it counts for nothing mm. if you're using new technolog technologies, which I, I would say 60% of the time we are using new technologies because we want to innovate and create yeah. new things. And uh, Agile allows you to get uh, sort of time frames and everything and uh, an idea of what's actually going to be achieved from the team and from yeah. the team's abilities, from the team's Rather experience. Rather than relying on that wishful thinking. Yeah, and, and real, real time feedback mm. as well, I suppose. That's right. That wishful thinking is, again, I think an example of uh, lack of flexibility. Mm. You know, it's like this is absolutely what we're going to do by this date. Yeah. And it doesn't allow any room, like you were saying, for innovation and mm -hmm. um, flexibility. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, this white paper, like I said, I'll be putting a link up to it on the live stream page mm -hmm. and you can download it. Um, and I'll be putting a link up to Paul's uh, cumulative flow diagram Definitely. stuff as well. And the weighted shortage job. Weighted shortage yeah, job yeah. as well, yeah. 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 So uh, thanks very much for uh, listening to us. We did overrun, so thanks for sticking with us. Yeah. And um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, see you in two weeks' time. Thanks, guys. Thank see you. Get